All right. Thank you, Doug. And I appreciate Doug really introducing this because we went from someone who's directly in the production to Doug, who's got the extension background. But what I really appreciate is that he introduced the idea of looking at the digestive anatomy, how the animal itself functions and using that to inform what we're going to be seeing in the manure. Um, the reason I say that is in my position here at Tarleton State, I'm actually an animal nutritionist. Even though I do have background in crop science and soil science, my primary function is as an animal nutritionist. So my talk on manure comes from my training in nutrition, but then also a look at what happens within the animal and how is that going to inform the rest of this. So my experience in cervids comes from research I did, one on cattle, but two, coming up with a book chapter talking about small ruminants and other ruminant animals and their manure production for a book that the Crop Science Society is about to release on animal manure. Uh, first, I want to really introduce you to the extent of management when it comes to these animals. The best information out there when it comes to what is it like to raise deer or raise cervids as a livestock species comes out of Texas A&M. When they put together that publication, we were looking at about 7,800 deer farms across the United States. And they surveyed several. The big four that they discussed, though, are the white-tailed deer, the elk, the fallow deer, and the red deer. And there's some different management considerations that go along with that. Now, before it just sounds like, you know, I'm using Texas A&M data, I'm living in Texas, before this sounds like a Texas talk, yes, if we look at the map, the largest concentration of those farms do exist in the state of Texas, but it's not an isolated incident. If we look at the second most, we've got to go over to the East Coast and look at Pennsylvania. And then third most, we end up going up to Minnesota. So it is really more of a national consideration, not just an isolated incident. Now, one thing I'll tell you is to wrap your head around this, you've got to imagine what this farm looks like. Uh, I'm very much like Aaron and some of the others. Most of my background is in your more traditional livestock, so I imagine a beef cattle operation, but you have to kind of change that imagination a little bit when it comes to looking at the raising of beer and of, of the other servants. Usually we're dealing with very small concentrations of animals. Um, with the exception of fallow deer, uh, you're going to be split in roughly thirds. You're going to have a third of your population dedicated to the male, a third to the female, and a third to the offspring. Fallow deer are a little different, and what I attribute this to is just the size of the animal. It, it's easier to have a lot more animals existing, but if you compare this to most of our other livestock species, that's a really big operation that we're looking at in terms of the male. So it is a much different scenario and a lot of that's got to do with management versus our other livestock species. If we take that management operation, so we take that idea of management and try to translate it moving into the farming characteristics and then even into the animal manure, there are certain costs that are just going to exist and we can take it from the economics all the way down to the manure. If you look at this economic breakdown that came from that publication, about 40% of your costs are going to be sunk into capital, 40% operational. There's not really much you're going to category. Like I said, my background is in nutrition. So the one that I tend to pay attention to is feed. Feed costs, in my view, are the one thing that you can look at that is a variable. It's something that can be changed that you can look at and it's going to more likely inform what you're looking at on the manure side. Again, if we picture this comparing it to other livestock, we would expect that farming of deer or farming of cervids would be more related to a very extensive operation. We would be looking at wide open spaces. This is where I'm going to directly tie deer back to cattle. Just like you have cattle, if you imagine the cow-calf scenario where you have more extensive pastures, where you've got them roam more freely and on top, more of a grazing type scenario, that does exist. That's going to be more on the sporting side of raising deer. If you're looking at the breeding side, so just like our other two presentations, especially alligators, where you have the breeding versus the raising, the breeding operations are going to look more like a confined operation. So we're going to be imagining more of our bull test or our feedlot scenario. 
Now, what are the particulars when it comes to the individual species? Well, it really depends on the mindset. If you look at the mindset when it comes to raising red deer or elk, the primary reason that these animals are raised has to do with a consumer demand for healthy meat alternatives. And when I say healthy, understand that I'm saying a consumer demand for a leaner meat source, a leaner meat source compared to beef, let's say. When you're looking at these animals, the other thing to consider, and it's with all of these species, these species are suited to land that we can't necessarily attribute to directly to crop production or even to raising our other livestock species. And that's because these animals are considered to be browsers. If we classify our ruminant animals and classify these as browsers, that means that they survive on marginal land. They're able to consume things that we would not feed their other livestock. I'm not gonna send cattle out and expect them to browse on leaves off of trees or bark off of trees where these animals would. So their suitability for marginal land really sets them up for, for some of those key areas where we can't get a lot of other agricultural production. We shift our mindset a little bit when it comes to the whitetail deer, and that's because the whitetail is not so much a focus on healthy meat alternatives, but more a focus on the sporting aspect. We're looking at operation of hunting ranches. So we've got some ranches that are going to focus solely on breeding those animals, selecting for the marketable characteristics. And then we're going to have operations that are just going to focus on trying to market them to the consumer. So marketing guided hunts. Now, I spent a lot of time talking about management. It sounds like I'm teaching a production class of deer. And that's really not where I'm going. I want to set you in that mindset of what's happening on these operations. Because as we look at raising the animal, that's going to inform what happens with the manure. And this is where I get to my point that expression of the manure nutrients is going to revolve around two things, two identifiable things that we can look at and that we can change. One is going to be diet composition and the other is diet digestibility. Those are both things that we can control when it comes to raising these animals. Because as we shift diet composition, so will we shift diet digestibility. Uh, putting together data for this, we start to look at what is typical of these animals. And I'm going to split them out just like I did on the management side and talk about the red deer and the elk versus the white-tailed deer. If we look at the red deer and elk, we're looking at their intake, and they're going to be consuming somewhere around 5% of their body weight a day. Of what they're consuming, of that 5%, about half of it is going to be digestible. So we focus really on these two numbers. And then when it comes to what we're concerned about with the manure, either on how do we handle that manure or how is it distributed, this becomes our other big one. We're looking at what's the digestibility of the crude protein in that manure. So instead of just throwing some numbers at you, I want to give you an illustration. Let's go through an example. Let's say that we're working with red deer. We're going to assume that that deer weighs about 440 pounds. All right, I said the first thing that we could affect was the diet. So we're going to look at the forage they consume. Well, I've already told you about how much they consume. So of this, we say that that 440 pound animal is going to consume 6.2 pounds of dry matter. Now, if we're looking at fresh forage, that's going to be about 13 pounds of fresh forage. But when we're looking at all this, we've got to stay on the dry matter number to keep things equal. If we take that then and look at the digestibility, our little poop emoji tells us that we end up with 2.9 pounds of dry matter in the feces. That's just giving an expression of that 52% digestibility. So this is per animal per day. If we're dealing with a confined operation, that could tend to build up over time. If we're looking at an extensive operation, so more of a pasture-based system, that's not as big of a concern. But let's look more into the characteristics of that manure. Let's say that the forage that they're consuming, this is marginal land, so we're going to be low crude protein. We're going to be under 8%, so about 7.5%. We then know with the crude protein digestibility, that manure is going to come out. We've got 0.31 pounds of crude protein makes it through the animal into the manure. So we can now characterize that manure. That manure is now going to be 1.6% nitrogen. 
that's going to be very similar to a lot of our livestock species where we already use their manures as fertilizer. The difference is going to be that we're dealing with a much drier manure. And with it being much drier, that gives us a lot of opportunity if this manure is collected. So if we're in the breeding operations where these animals are in confinement, that gives us a lot of opportunity that can exist there. The reason I go through all of this is I want to give you some comparisons. It depends based on that servant operation what you're doing. If we look at the white-tailed deer, we've got a completely different scenario. Their intake is roughly the same. We're within a half percent of body weight or 0.8 percent of body weight. Digestibility roughly the same. So I wouldn't consider these two numbers to be that unusual. Those are nearly consistent across the board when it comes to servant livestock. What I want to point out though is the crude protein digestibility. Research that has been done on these species on the feeding side shows that white-tailed deer are much more efficient at, nitro at nitrogen utilization. So let's go through the same scenario. Let's take our white-tailed deer at 125 pounds, so a smaller animal. With it being a smaller animal, we already know it's going to consume less. So we're going to cut our consumption down from six pounds to two pounds, cut it in a third. With that digestibility, we end up with one pound dry matter excretion. Now, this becomes a manageable number whether we're extensive or intensive. This is a number that we can deal with and we're not gonna have a manure buildup as quickly. The interesting thing comes though in crude protein. That same forage that we would have fed the red deer and we would have ended up with a manure that was 1.6% nitrogen. Now we've got a manure that's 1% nitrogen. We're able to use this manure more extensively. Lower nitrogen concentration, yes, it means that you're not getting as much bang for the buck when it comes to the newer nutrients, but you're also not limited as much on how much can be applied. I take you through these calculations because if we look at what's published in the literature, I'm going to echo Doug on this one. Doug was saying that there's really not much out there on manure characteristics of alligators. His was none. My talk is not necessarily none. We do have some, but to say it's limited is an understatement. There's uh, one thing that Erin brought up the other day when she and I were talking about this. There's zero information out there about deer urine. And we all know that when it comes to the total nutrient management prospect, that urine can have a big impact, especially when we talk about nitrogen relations. But if we're just looking at manure characteristics, I take you through that because it illustrates where we're getting these numbers we were able to calculate that one to 2% nitrogen that was going to appear in the manure. We were able to account for that low, or that high dry matter percentage, low moisture in the feces. So it's just a way to illustrate and tie together that relationship between feeding the animal and managing the animal. And that concludes my talk on cervids. I believe now I turn it back over to Aaron 